So uh, broadly speaking, the question that many of us are interested in is in trying to work out the generalizable principles that cells use in order to build robustness during development. And what's fascinating about development is how you start with a small number of totipotent cells, and in the, in the relatively short time that an organism develops, you get all these complex differentiated cell types, uh, both in the right numbers and in the right locations that, that result in the adult organism. So today I'm going to talk to you about a specific early developmental decision that we've been studying in order to learn something about the general principles that underlie this robustness. So what you see schematized up here is the early mouse embryo. So the stuff in gray is the trophectoderm. Um, and you can see the corresponding images of these embryos below. Now at a very early stage of mouse development, cells from the inner cell mass, which is this yellow stuff here, undergo a fake decision that uh, and give rise to, to two different cell types. One is the cells of the epiblast, which is what you see in green, and cells of the primitive endoderm, which is what you see in pink. Um, now, there are a couple of really curious observations about this differentiation event. The first is that these cell types are observed in a seemingly random spatial pattern, which has been called a salt and pepper pattern. And the second is that they occur in a relatively conserved ratio. Now, these fate decisions result from activation of transcription factor networks that are centered around the transcription factors NANOG and GATA. And these fates are functionally antagonistic in the sense that when, um, when you have a NANOG positive epiblast cell, then GATA is inhibited in the cell. And when you have a GATA positive epiblast cell, then NANOG is inhibited in this. Okay, so this is the genetic network that we, we know, but what are the signaling molecules that interact with it? Well, we know from elegant mutational studies that the paracrine growth factor FGF4 is responsible for this differentiation. So basically, if you knock out the FGF4 gene, then you fail to get primitive endoderm differentiation. And upon bathing the embryos in exogenous FGF, you get almost all primitive endoderm cells. Uh, so in other words, FGF biases this fate decision uh, towards these uh, GATA expressing primitive endoderm cells. Uh, what's still an active area of research, however, is how you get robust proportions from this model that I've shown you here. Because in the way that I've drawn it out, it suggests that you have to operate in really a very fine range of FGF concentrations in order to get certain ratios of cell types. Now, to investigate this, we used an embryonic stem cell model that recapitulates some aspects of this fate decision. So here we use a doxycycline inducible GATA cell line with which we can induce primitive endoderm differentiation in ESCs. So the way this works is that we uh, give cells a pulse of doxycycline, um, and then this activates the GATA factor, uh, which then impinges on the endogenous GATA, GATA nanog network, uh, which I should point out are in the endogenous genomic and regulatory context. So here, if we have high amount of induced GATA, then we push cells towards a primitive endoderm lineage. And if we have a low amount of in in induced GATA, then we can push cells towards a epiblast-like lineage. Uh, so now by tuning the amount of induced GATA, we can basically initialize this mutually repressive network at different initial conditions, and then study how the system resolves itself, and then see if we can work out where the robustness comes from. OK, so experimentally, this is how we do it. <clears throat> we start with Nanog expressing ES and different durations of doxycycline, which is what you see schematized down here. And this will bring the cells to this yellow co-expression state, where they're expressing both factors, albeit at slightly different ratios. And the second phase of the experiment, uh, we allow these cells to differentiate. Uh, and uh, after about 40 hours of differentiation, we fix and stain the cells, and we, uh, we analyze them to quantify the, the, the relative cell types, the proportions of cell types that we get. Now, just to give you a sense for what this range of initial conditions looks like, Sorry, let me move this out of the way. Um, uh, here are some ESC, uh, ES column doses, and that down this column, more induced data expression, lower nanog expression. So now the expectation is that the ratio of final differentiated cell types will ultimately depend on this starting point, right? Because if we have high amounts of induced data, then we should get more primitive endoderm like cells. Uh, however, when we looked at the differentiated cells, we saw something quite surprising. And that is that for a wide range of initial conditions, you actually wind up with very similar ratios of differentiated cell types. And that, that this is what we have quantified up here. So here the stuff in pink is the GATA positive cells. In green, we have the NANOG positive cells. Uh, and here we have the double positive and double negative population. 
So this tells us that somehow cells are able to buffer these different starting points and then move towards a more uniform differentiation ratio. So how do they do this? Well, it's likely that this is a decision that's being taken at a population level. Um, and I've already told you that the growth factor FGF4 feeds into this network. So what we next did is we looked at uh, what the effect of FGF was here. Okay, now just as a quick reminder, uh, FGF4 is a paracrine factor that cells secrete. So while in regular FGF4 wild type cells, you get this ratio of differentiated cell types, we found that you lose primitive endoderm differentiation upon knocking out the FGF4. So we only get these green nanog positive cells. And that when you add back recombinant FGF, you can simultaneously inhibit nanog and promote GATA expression. Um, so we know basically that FGF uh, regulates this GATA nanog circuit. But what regulates FGF4? So to look at this, we followed a time course of inducible GATA protein expression and FGF4 mRNA staining. Uh, and so this is what you see down here. In red is the inducible GATA protein, and in cyan is the FGF4 mRNA. And I want to draw your attention here to the four-hour time point, where you can see that as soon as we have a substantial amount of this inducible GATA protein present, we get a significant reduction in the amount of FGF4 mRNA staining. Now, because FGF4 mRNA is repressed so rapidly after inducing GATA4 expression, what we think is that the GATA factors might be directly inhibiting FGF signaling. Now, this FGF4 is an extracellular molecule, and cells are always you know, embedded in a colony rather than being individuals floating around on a dish. So rather than think about this as a single cell fate decision, we approach this as a population level decision that requires constant cell-to-cell -cell communication. Okay, so if we have this idea that cell-to-cell -cell communication is the thing that drives robustness, the first, things, first thing we need to test this is actually a way to break the communication. And the way we do this is we use these FGF4 mutant cells that cannot produce any FGF4 or basically have broken communication. Now, I'm just reproducing this figure from an earlier slide just to remind you that we can get robust proportioning from a wide range of initial conditions in the FGF4 wild-type cells that are constantly communicating. But we find that when we, we, we break this communication, now all of a sudden, the, 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 the ratio of differentiated cell types reflects the initial conditions. So it's clear that active FGF signaling between cells is crucial for this robust proportioning to occur. Together with our collaborators, Angel and Aneta, we built a dynamical systems model that's based on this topology. And this model wonderfully phenocopied these experimental observations. So here they start cells out at different initial conditions. So here each dot is one cell. Uh, and they find that in the communicating simulations, they're able to recover this robust proportioning, while in the non-communicating cells, you suddenly get this fragility or the sensitivity to initial conditions. Uh, so we next use this model to investigate the dynamical mechanism of cell fate specification. And Angel and Aneta discovered that a certain type of population-based dynamical solution which is called an inhomogeneous steady state, might be responsible for fate specification in the system. So what you see here is a bifurcation diagram with nanog expression strength on the x-axis as a bifurcation parameter, uh, and the solid lines indicate stable steady states. So these two gray branches, uh, these, are the con these are branches that are called conjugate branches, which means that for a two-cell system, if one cell occupies one branch, then the other must necessarily occupy the other. So together with Christian, they've published a detailed work on the description of this class of dynamical systems earlier this year. And for anyone who's interested in an in-depth theoretical description, as well as uh, a description of how cell lineage and growth come into play, I can point you to this fantastic piece of work down here. Uh, but the message to take away from this is that the way cells make these, these fate decisions is at a population level, and it's, it only occurs due to cell-to-cell -cell communication. Now, this result is true regardless of whether cells are locally or globally coupled. So we next wanted to investigate the range of FGF signaling. And what we found was that despite FGF4 being a soluble secreted factor, it acts very locally in 2D cultures. So uh, we did three experiments to look at this, but I'm just going to show you one today. So in this experiment, what we did is we seeded some FGF4 wild type cells on a bed of FGF mutant cells. Uh, and you can see the FGF wild type cells in cyan here. Um, and all the other cells in this, in this colony are FGF mutant cells, so they don't produce any FGF. Uh, 
Uh, in the quantification on the right, you can see the results of scoring the number of differentiated GATA positive cells uh, after we blinded ourselves to the presence of these FGF wild type cells. And here we found that indeed the colonies with the FGF producers tend to show more differentiated cells than the others. Now we measured the range of FGF signaling as being approximately two cell diameters. So we went back and plugged this into our model and we simulated cells on a 20 by 20 grid and found that we were able to recover this salt and pepper based spatial patterning. This is also reflected in our immunostainings of cells early in the differentiation process and is somewhat evocative of the pattern that we see in the developing embryo. And so with that, I'd like to wrap up. Today, I've shown you that cell fates are not decided by single cells in isolation, but rather as a population-based uh, mechanism. I've also shown you that local FGF signaling can result in this global proportioning that we get. Uh, and finally, that couple cell models with cell fate specification uh, can result in new emergent dynamical solutions, such as the inhomogeneous steady state solution. So with that, I'd like to thank all the co-authors and the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Physiology for supporting our work. And I'm, of course, happy to take any questions. Great. That, that's, I think, a great example of how uh, these in vitro systems can really start to get at really systems biologic questions. Um, are there any questions? So I'm looking in the Q&A box, and I don't see any at the moment. Um, so I'll start with a question. Mm -hmm. um, do you think if you added a low level of exogenous FGF, you would just blunt the whole system? You would lose yeah. that sort of uh, feedback cell-cell uh, uh, communication. Yeah, so we actually found that we can override the system by adding lots of exogenous FGF. So you can take the FGF wild type cells and you can add a bunch of FGF onto them and this will push the cells to differentiate into primitive endodermic cells. Yeah, and and so your, vi your audio is cutting out a little bit. Oh, oops. Let me, let me say that again. Um, so what we did do is we took the FGF wild type cells and we added a bunch of exogenous FGF and we found that we could push all of these cells, well nearly all of them, to differentiate into primitive endodermal cells. Um, so they retain the capacity to differentiate, um, but I'm, I'm not sure if I've answered your question because you asked about whether it blunts their ability to communicate with one another. So well, you're asking more about sort of the robustness of the differentiation that we get afterwards? Yeah, it seems with your model, it really depends on FGF acting on its immediate neighbor. And that's mm -hmm. more or less how a lot of FGFs work. But if you were to just titrate in uh, lower levels and then increasing levels, I'm wondering if it would just disrupt the system. Sure, you can force it by dumping a bucket load of FGF4 in there, but the robustness of the system, I wonder if that depends on the immediate paracrine interactions versus a longer range effect of FGF4. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think that's a good question because, um, I mean, I'm just trying to think how we would test for robustness. We could probably disaggregate the cells and bring them back together again in the presence of a low level of FGF to see how reproducibly we can get ratios after this. Um, so we haven't tested robustness, but I can tell you, I can tell you something about sort of the different ranges of communication. And we've found, at least uh, with the theoretical work that Angel and Meta have done, um, that the, the the range of the signaling doesn't really matter all that much to get the proportioning. The range matters more to get sort of the spatial pattern in the field. Okay. So we have two other questions. Um, what? determines the initial level of GATA6 and NANOG in vivo? Um, so in vivo, uh, in the mouse embryo originally, so at around day 3 to 3.5, you actually have these, uh, these cells express both GATA and NANOG. Um, there are some ideas that there might be some initial heterogeneity in, these, in the expression level. Specification down the line, uh, but there's been some more recent work that shows that um, this is actually a, a very regulated process. So if you remove some of the, um, the primitive endoderm-like cells, the cells that are fated to become primitive endoderm-like, um, then the, the system can sort of adapt to those changes. Um, mm -hmm. Which is to say that there might be initial heterogeneities in, in the levels of expression of these two things, but um, this, you know, these cells are constantly communicating with one another. 
um, and trying yeah. to get this defined ratio. Yep. Yeah. Um, so do the two cell types have different morphologic features, like size? Um, I can, so I've never personally looked at an embryo, I have to confess, uh, mm -hmm. but I can tell you that from the 2D system that we work with, looking uh, at the cells on the dish, uh, they certainly do. Like the, the more differentiated primitive endoderm-like cells uh, are generally a bit bigger. The epi-like cells are generally a bit smaller. Uh, they sort of the epi-like cells tend to cluster a bit closer together. So yeah, I mean, they are sort of morphologically, more, morphologically different once they, once they differentiate. Mm -hmm. uh, can you comment on the distribution of cells expressing FGF receptor? Uh, no, unfortunately, we haven't really looked at the FGF receptor expression. Uh, but that's a great question. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. We, we, didn't, we didn't do that experiment. Yeah. Uh, and, um, it's certainly interesting to see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So lastly, are there known EPS binding sites for the GATA6 regulatory regions? Uh, are they are they known what binding sites? So the ETS binding sites, the, the oh. transcriptional effectors of the FGF pathway in, in GATA6, uh, GATA6 gene. Uh, so that's that, that question gets to um, how, whether FGF directly um, or sort of indirectly regulates uh, GATA expression. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say, I do not know the answer to that, I'm afraid. I know in other contexts, I think it does, uh, okay. but it, in this context, I, I'm not sure either. All right. Well, that was a great talk.